Good morning. Welcome to Religious Education Congress 2019, Thirsting for Justice. My name is Erin Avila, and I welcome you to join me in prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Loving God, your heart is ever drawn nearer to those who cry out to you. Open our ears to hear their plea and move our hearts to act justly and with humility. Break the chains of all who are captive, whether in body, mind, or spirit. Reunite those who have been separated, and through your Son, Jesus Christ, may all that we say and do bear fruit in abundance. We ask this through the same Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. Welcome to the first session of this Congress, giving reason for hope that is within us with Bishop Robert Barron. <clears throat> bishop Robert Barron is Auxiliary Bishop of the Archdiocese of Los Angeles and the founder of Word on Fire Catholic Ministries. He is the host of Catholicism, a groundbreaking, award-winning documentary about the Catholic faith, which aired on PBS. Bishop Barron is a number one Amazon best-selling author and has pub published numerous books, essays, and articles on theology and the spiritual life. He is a religion correspondent for NBC and has also appeared on Fox News, CNN, and EWTN. I am honored to introduce Bishop Robert Barron. Thank you very much. Okay, good morning, everybody. Always a joy to be here at the Congress. I started coming in 1997, my first Congress. And uh, back in the years when I was in Chicago, I come typically every other year. And now uh, it's a joy to be auxiliary bishop here in LA, so I come all the time. And uh, <laughs> wonderful to see so many of you. Um, I'll just give you a little hint. I, I don't know if anyone came to my talk uh, here last year. I talked about beauty and Catholicism. And uh, for the first time in an arena this size, I used a PowerPoint. Now, I belong to the non-PowerPoint generation, right? So they entrusted me with the little thing to, you know, uh, advance the pictures. And so I give my talk. <laughs> if you remember, it was a bit of a disaster. I mean, I, I hit the button too many times and the pictures flew through. I would look up and say, oh, that's pretty good. <laughs> Well, my crew, my Word on Fire team, made up of mostly millennials and younger, were just hitting their foreheads, you know. And they said, you must never do that again. So, <laughs> so we are going to have PowerPoint, but there's a, a great uh, young man, John Carney, who's back here in the bowels of the stadium somewhere, and he'll be actually doing the PowerPoint. So, uh, yeah, a hand for John. Uh, just a, a quick uh, practical word, you know, in the arena we don't do Q&A, it's a little bit too uh, unwieldy, but I'm going to go directly after the talk over to the book signing area. So please come if you want to and, you know, I can sign a book for you or you just want to ask a question, so just come. I won't be able to stay or entertain questions right away, but do come. I guess it's over that way, huh? Good. So I think we all agree the number one problem facing the church today is the clergy sex abuse scandal. I mean, that goes without saying. And I'm actually working on a, a small book called an extended essay or more of a letter 
uh, on that subject. So as we speak, I'm actually writing that. Um, I didn't think it was quite ripe uh, yet for me to talk about today. So I thought I, I'd take my default position to what is clearly the second most important problem facing the church today, which is the rising tide of the unaffiliated. You know, for some years, uh, and I was one of the people that did this, we referred to this group as the nuns, right? The N-O-N-E-S. But that's kind of gotten tired. And I think we explained about a thousand times, I don't mean N-U-N-S, etc. So we've now kind of shifted and we call them the unaffiliated. So here's the thing, everybody, you know this. Uh, more and more it's the case that people are not coming to our institutions to be evangelized as they used to. So we could trust that people would come to our schools and our parishes and institutions to be evangelized. Well, they're not. We know the numbers of baptisms and weddings, especially confirmations too, are trending downward. But the even more disturbing thing is this fact of the unaffiliated. More and more people drifting away from our church into the ranks of those who claim no religion. So what I'm going to do in the course of this morning, very briefly with you, is look at three simple questions. First question, who are the unaffiliated? Can we name them and describe them? Secondly, why are they leaving? Thirdly, how do we get them back? Or nuance that a little bit, how do we keep them from becoming unaffiliated, right? So who are they? That's for the empiricists. We'll look at a lot of uh, statistics. Why are they leaving? That's for the theoreticians. What are the reasons why these young kids, and not young kids, older people too, are leaving? And then finally, for the pragmatists, how do we get them back? Okay? So that's the scorecard if you're keeping score, those three questions. How's John doing so far with the pictures? Is he getting them? All right, good. So, first of all, who are the unaffiliated? I suggest a, a good way to get into it is by making a sharp contrast. So when I was a kid, back in the early 1970s, you know what the figure was for the unaffiliated in our country? Those who would claim no religion. It was about 3%. That means early 70s, and many of us in this room are old enough to remember the early 70s, 97% uh, of our country claimed a religious identity. Now, that's not to say they were all ardently religious or ardently practicing. Nevertheless, it was very rare for someone to say, I'm not religious. Now, the number by the early 90s goes up it significantly. It rises, in fact, 100% from 3% to 6%. So again, a kind of a, a remarkable increase in those 20 years but still, in absolute numbers, not that many. Early 90s, still, 94% of our country would claim a religious identification. And again, I know some in this room old enough to remember that there was something different in the texture of the culture back in like the 70s and 80s. When religion was kind of taken much more for granted, you sort of assumed that everybody had a religious connection or, or outlook on life. But now watch something. In the years between 1991 and today, there has been a staggering and dramatic increase in the numbers of the unaffiliated. We've gone from 6% now to 25%. Amazing. In my lifetime, from 3% of the country being unaffiliated to fully one quarter of the country and everybody, can you sense that in the culture? I think it's, it's obvious. You can. We're becoming a less and less religious society. And as I've said before, if you look now at young people, you start controlling these figures for young people, things get even more startling. For those under 30, the percentage of the unaffiliated rises to 40%. For Catholic young people, bleaker still, the numbers rise to 50%. So think for a second now. Young Catholics under 30, people that came of age within the Catholic faith, baptized, confirmed, 
some kind of education probably, but now fully half of them claim no religion. Here's something else, and I find this statistic very striking. The age at which young people are opting out of religion is getting lower and lower. So it used to be, let's say, between 20 and 30, ages 20 and 30, people tended to opt out. Now it's much more between the ages of 10 and 20. Median age, 13. Extraordinary, isn't it? 13-year-olds, median age of those who are opting out of religion. Something else, and I've cited this before, it's actually gotten a little bit worse since I began citing it. For every one person joining the Catholic Church, it's now 6.3% 6.3 are leaving. Think about that. For every one person joining our church, 6.3 are leaving. I thought of this, I must say, a few weeks ago up in my region. I had the two wonderful rites of election, you know, when we welcome new candidates into the Catholic Church. And they're beautiful, wonderful. It was a great event. But I kept thinking, for every one person joining, 6.3 are leaving. Another finding you see in all the surveys, unfortunately, that those who are leaving the faith are tending more and more to stay away permanently. So we used to say, we'd comfort ourselves by saying, well, sure, a lot of them are leaving, but, you know, they tend to come back. Unfortunately, that's less and less true. Some more as we're looking at who are the unaffiliated. And this one, I would say, is of particular importance to this arena full of people involved in religious education, right? Listen to this. A survey, the Pew Forum did a survey a few years ago on general religious knowledge. So just asking people questions about religion in general. Those who did the best on this test were Jews and Mormons and atheists. Now, again, not too surprising because atheists have to define themselves over and against religion, so they knew a lot about religion. The Jews, the Mormons, and atheists. Mainstream Protestants and evangelicals were kind of in the middle. Guess who came in last? Now, I, I'm talking to an arena full of religious educators. I'm one of them, too. I think this is a, a very serious wake-up call, everybody, that Catholics were among the worst at general religious knowledge. That's just one of the marks of the unaffiliated. I don't know if you know the work of this uh, uh, woman, Jean Twenge, is a professor at uh, San Diego, professor of psychology, wrote a great book called iGen. So think of, you know, the iPhone, so the iPad, it's the iGen. So it's the generation, the, the youngest contingent today, who grew up with these uh, machines, right? Well, she says a lot of really interesting things about these, these young people. Read the book. But she's got a chapter on religion, which is very illuminating. Here's one of her insights. We used to say that even though young people tend to be not that religious, they're still spiritual. You know, they still believe in God. They still believe in the immortality of the soul and an afterlife and ethical principles, et cetera, et cetera. Her conclusion is, sadly, they're getting both less religious and less spiritual. Now, it's not too surprising, really. Think of, um, it's Will Hertzberg gave us the famous cut flowers theory, right? If you cut flowers out of the, you know, off the plant that's in the ground, and you, you stick them in a vase with water, they'll look pretty good for a while, right? They'll look perfectly fine. But in pretty short order, those flowers are going to fade. Well, what's happened? We have indeed cut a lot of the flower of spirituality off from their religious roots. That means in a church, in doctrine, in practice, in a community, Therefore, are we surprised that these flowers have begun to fade? That young people are now increasingly not religious and not spiritual. That's, that's the Gene Twenge. Just a couple more, everybody, on this, who are the unaffiliated? 
Christian Smith is a researcher at the University of Notre Dame who's done, I think, some of the best work in this area. And it's based on extensive surveys with uh, young people, with what he calls young former Catholics. So people that began involved or baptized, confirmed members of the church, and now have drifted away. Here's one of his insights. He says, most young former Catholics say they are uncomfortable making any definite statements about who or what God is. They're uncomfortable making any definite statements about who or what God is. Now, you can see it, can't you, in light of the general relativism of our time. You know, your truth, my truth, but there's no real objective truth. But it seems even more so true of religious claims. How about this, that... Um, only 33% of those who have drifted away think that God is a personal being. Um, can I submit to you, everybody in this room, if, if we don't think God's a personal being, we have some serious trouble with our religious education. I mean, our whole system is predicated upon the assumption that God is a person of love, knowledge, who addresses us personally. But a lot of our kids hold that God is not a person. Here's something else now from Christian Smith's survey that I think is, is uh, instructive. Here's a quote from one of his um, interviewees. I'm so okay with uncertainty. I think uncertainty is beautiful. I think the most beautiful works of art are ones that lead you to asking questions as opposed to those trying to supply answers to what something is. Another one. The essence of spirituality is being comfortable with questions. Now, I'm not going to say a lot about this. I just want to lay it out to you. But mind you, they're not saying, oh yeah, a very important part of the process of coming to religious truth is asking questions. Yeah, I mean, I completely agree with that. Or that the asking of questions is an important moment in the spiritual journey. I'll grant you that. But if the asking of questions is the essence of it, that simply being comfortable with a permanently open-ended, I'm not sure where we go with evangelization and real catechesis, if that's the attitude. You probably heard this. It's a famous phrase now from Christian Smith's research. He said, most young people believe in a version of what he calls moralistic therapeutic deism. Moralistic therapeutic deism. Now, what does that mean? It means they think God is at a distance from us. So there's the deism part of it. He doesn't interact much with people. Yet he does judge behavior. There's the moralistic side. And his purpose is to make us psychologically happy. There's the therapeutic side. So most of the unaffiliated he talks to would hold to some version of this uh, moralistic therapeutic deism. Obvious question how close is that to a biblical understanding of who God is? Here's another thing from Smith's findings, and I think anyone dealing with young people will recognize this right away. Listen. Most former young Catholics grow up in religiously diverse environments, and hence tend to find any insistence on one way of being religious as oppressive or exclusive. Let me say it again. They find any insistence on one way of being religious as oppressive or exclusive. Again, making evangelization a little difficult when you're announcing this is the faith. How about one, one last observation under this rubric of, of who are the unaffiliated? Though some people suggest the young people are leaving often in an unconscious manner, just kind of drifting away, and there's some indication of that in some of the surveys. But I think what's becoming increasingly clear is that young people more and more are consciously and deliberately moving away from the church. So not just drifting away, but consciously and deliberately choosing to leave the faith behind. Here's the bottom line. I'll give the last word to Brandon Vaught, who's one of the best commentators, I think, on this issue today. 
he says the church is hemorrhaging young people. Now, um, depressing? Yeah, kind of. But we got to be clear-eyed about it, it seems to me. All of us in this room, we're all committed to religious education, to evangelization, to doing the work of the church. The young people are the future of our church. We can't be Pollyannish about it. We can't be blind to these realities. I mean, one of the problems is if we don't, if we don't answer this first question clearly, who are the unaffiliated? We're not going to be able to answer the, the uh, uh, find the solution very effectively. Okay? So, second great question. Why are they leaving? Why are so many, especially of the young, leaving? So the first uh, presentation is for the uh, empiricists, people that like the numbers and to analyze data. The second one is more for theoreticians. So what are the reasons, the patterns, the causes behind this disaffiliation? Now, first of all, and I'm talking to a room full of my fellow religious types, so I'm, I'm accusing myself, too, very much of this. Um, I found that when you ask people in the church, hey, how come you think young people are leaving? They're very willing to give answers. <laughs> we, I think we, we tend, we religious types, to be a bit, you know, we, we pontificate a bit. Uh, and people are very ready and willing and able to give answers. Um, but I, I, what we overlook is there's a lot of objective data around this question. We don't have to go on subjective impressions or anecdotal evidence or here's what my gut tells me. I mean, maybe those things are right. But there's a lot of objective data when it comes to the question of the unaffiliated. And what I'm going to do is, um, is look at it. You know, I, I think of, um, of Pope Francis. You know, I had the great privilege last October of being a delegate to the Youth um, Synod. Uh, the Pope's letter is about to come out, by the way. That's the fruit of that whole process. But what the Pope said to us over and over again was, listen to the young people. Listen to the young people. And I think that's dead right. The trouble is a lot of us who are kind of in the religion business, we don't really listen. <laughs> we say, oh, here's the theory. Here's, here's my impression. Here's why they're leaving. Actually, they've told us. Uh, there's a lot of information if we perk up our ears and listen. Okay? So, why are they leaving? Here's my first stop on this little tour. Two Pew Forum studies, very recent. One from 2016, the second from 2018. Asking the, dis the unaffiliated, how come you left? Simple question. In the first um, survey from 2016, fully one half, 50% of the disaffiliated said, I left because of a lack of belief in religious teachings. Now, mind you, and the, the second survey, the one from 2018, asked the same question, 60% of the respondents said, I don't believe in religious teachings. Now, it's a couple things. First of all, they're not talking about ethical teachings. I'll get to those. That's a reason. The church is teaching, especially on sexual ethics. They're talking here about something more fundamental. The church's teachings on God, Jesus, the sacraments, the church, salvation, eternal life, Second observation, I bet a lot of us, because I hear it all the time, when asked, how come young people are leaving? They would not think immediately of intellectual reasons. They'd say, oh, it's bad behavior on the part of priests, or they weren't welcomed, or they had a bad experience in their parish. And, and those are in the surveys. I'll get to them. But they are not the dominant reason. And, and this, by the way, I'm just giving you two. This is consistent across the board. And religious educators, listen to me, the young people are saying, I'm disaffiliating because I don't believe the basic teachings. It's an intellectual problem, block, obstacle that's leading a lot of young people to leave. 
And as I've said before, in fact, in this very arena, they very often correlate this to the issue of religion and science. Science and religion seem to be in opposition. Here's something now from um, Christian Smith's research when he's asking former young Catholics, how come you left? Number one reason, religion seems illogical and repugnant to science. So there's a nice summary that catches both sides of that. Religious belief seems illogical and repugnant to science. Smith furthermore says that 59%, so almost 60% of the young former Catholics agree with the statement that science and religion conflict with each other. Well, guess who wins in their minds? Now, everybody, listen to me. This is, this is a tragedy. And I'm standing here as a very unworthy representative of the Catholic intellectual tradition which embraces faith and reason, that loves the life of the mind, that holds up Augustine and Chrysostom and Jerome and Thomas Aquinas and John Henry Newman and G.K. Chesterton, that, that defends the claim that science and religion are not at war with each other. We have not gotten through to our young people on this. To me, this is a great tragedy that we're the tradition in a way best equipped to deal with this problem. We are not fundamentalists. We don't, we don't keep reason at bay. We don't say science is the enemy of faith. And yet, our own kids, our own young people, are claiming these as the major reason they're leaving. Ay, 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 religious educators, we got a serious problem here. Now, I know, multi-causes, I get it. There are a lot of causes for this. But I think it should be, for us, a major wake-up call. Here's a quote. I think this is from um, Stephen Bullivant's research. I don't know if you know that name. Stephen Bullivant, B-U-L-L-I-V-A-N-T, is a very fine researcher in England who's been really focused on this question of disaffiliation. And a number of these quotes I'm getting from his research. Um, here's one from a young, uh, young man, 37. Now I wonder if a God really exists. I believe God was once used to explain phenomena which, which are now explained by science. And now from a young woman, 18, in all honesty, I feel religion is a somewhat outdated notion. And now that we have scientific advances, we no longer need a higher being to explain how we came to be on this earth. I now put my faith in science. That's a very common attitude among young people, I must say. Okay, so that's number one, uh, deep difficulty at the intellectual level, especially with the challenge of the sciences. Now, just a few more, and these are born of, of research and also my own experience doing this evangelical work for now for many years online, where I'm in touch with people from way outside the church too. A very common complaint of the nuns or the unaffiliated is that religion seems to foster violence. I'm sure you've heard that. Uh, the new atheists really took advantage of that prejudice, you know. And they emerged after September 11th. Think of, of Dawkins and Hitchens and Sam Harris. They emerged after September 11th, which confirmed the old Enlightenment view, right, that since religion is irrational, it tends to be violent. Since religious people can't adjudicate their disputes rationally, they have recourse to violence. I can't tell you how many times I've heard young people say some version of most wars in human history have been caused by religion. By the way, demonstrably false. And it'd be good for us to get access to those data because it's demonstrably false. E even the most cursory view of history shows that that's not the case. But yet, it's deep in the minds of our young people especially that we tend to be violent. Another very common block, I come across it, I would say, every day in my work. The disconnect between the objective metaphysical and moral claims of religion and the dominant culture of self-invention. Let me say that again. The 
objective metaphysical, so what's the world like, moral, how should we behave, claims of religion, and the dominant cultural assumption that, no, these are things that we, we invent for ourselves. We make up our own truth and our own value, right? Which is a very dominant view in the culture today. I don't know if we have the, uh, the pictures there, but three of the figures I think that are really important here in the history of ideas. One is Friedrich Nietzsche, the other is Jean-Paul Sartre, and a third is Michel Foucault. Nietzsche, Nietzsche, to my mind, the most influential of the 19th century philosophers. God is dead, says Nietzsche. There are no objective values. Therefore, it's through an assertion of our own will that we create our own values. Now, that was pretty radical stuff in the 19th century. That's in the mind of almost every teenager today, it seems to me. Right? It's through my, my will to power, I invent the world of value that I live in. One of his disciples in the 20th century, Jean-Paul Sartre, the founder of existentialism, so-called because Sartre said, existence precedes essence. I know that sounds super technical. It really isn't. All he means is, my freedom comes first. And then I decide who I am. See, don't tell me objectively who I am and therefore how I ought to behave. Rather, no, no, I come first. My freedom comes first. And then I decide who I am and what I stand for. Again, does that sound familiar? It's, it's uh, every young person in America. Radical stuff in the mid-20th century, now common. Michel Foucault, a th another disciple of Nietzsche, who says what look like objective truth claims about the world and about morality are really just plays of power. One powerful group asserting itself over another. Again, sound familiar? <laughs> Almost every campus debate takes that form today. It, let's not talk about the truth of, of what you're claiming. Let's just unmask the power play that's involved. Okay, you see the point I'm making, though, is when this attitude holds sway, as it does in our culture, it becomes very difficult for a religion to come forward and say, no, here's the way things are. Here's the way you ought to behave. When these two things conflict, a lot of young people say, I'm going with Nietzsche and Sartre and, and Foucault. Okay, so... In line with that first finding, I've been emphasizing some of these intellectual reasons, which are definitely real and are, are offered as number one reason why young people are leaving. But without gainsaying any of that, I'll now say a word about some of the other more behavioral reasons why young people are leaving. We do indeed in the surveys hear mention of unwelcoming atmospheres in parishes. So we do hear about that. It's not number one by any means, but it's there that those who get disaffiliated felt they weren't welcomed in parishes. They do sometimes talk about mistreatment on the part of church personnel. They do. Now, it's been, it's been skewed, all this stuff, by the McCarrick thing. So we have to look at, at data now after McCarrick. I'm going on pretty recent stuff here, but McCarrick has, has certainly skewed all that. You do indeed hear, though, about clericalism and about the clergy sex abuse scandal. You do indeed hear about boring and irrelevant liturgies. So those come up in the surveys as well. And then, finally, as you guess, and I won't rehearse all these quotes, but the church's sexual teaching is indeed a major block for a lot of young people, is indeed the reason they say they leave. And just I'll look at, at three uh, quickly. The first one is the divorce and remarriage issue. Now, for somewhat older disaffiliated people, this is the case. Just one quote I'll give from Bullivant's research. Here's a woman, age 36. Now I'm not allowed to receive Holy Eucharist. As this is the heart of the Mass, it's too painful to watch everyone else receiving, but I am not able to, so I don't go anymore. And again, anyone involved in pastoral ministry knows about this 
uh, dilemma, right? And there's many more quotes I could give. Um, but a second major uh, concern under this moral rubric is the church's teaching on sex outside of marriage. So here's one from Bolivant's research. This is a young man, age 24. The religious practice that sex must occur between a man and a woman after they have married is an archaic mode of thinking and goes completely against the freedom of two people expressing their love for each other. Again, a pretty representative. Anyone that's been involved with young people knows a pretty representative view, and that's why he's left. But the third one I want to point to, because it's especially powerful among the youngest of the unaffiliated, is the church's teaching on homosexuality and transgenderism seems to bother the youngest of the disaffiliated the most. Just a couple of quotes. Jesus is a man who'd be appalled at how the church talks about homosexuals. The current pope has tried to speak about this issue. However, when there's a new pope, we'll be back to the point where I have to apologize to my liberal friends for being Catholic. Um, mind you, everybody, I'm not advocating. I'm reporting here, okay? So don't write to some crackpot website and say I'm, I'm just reporting what people are saying. A uh, second quote, I'll just give you one more. This is from a um, uh, woman of 38. I find the doctrine that homosexuality is disordered very troubling. I have a number of gay friends, both men and women, and can testify there's nothing disordered about them or their lives. What is disordered is dishonesty and misuse in sexual relationships, you know, etc. And again, I, I say it simply as representative of the views, and you know that, of a lot of people. So the church's sexual teaching is a significant block that's leading people away. Do you know, uh, a friend of mine who was involved in this work, and he, was, he knew he was oversimplifying, but he said, in some ways, it comes down to sex and science. <laughs> and again, that's oversimplifying, but there's something to it that what's, it's like, what's bugging people the most as they leave? It's sex and science. That they're upset with the church's teaching on sexual issues and uh, science, broadly speaking, you know, the whole reason, faith thing. Okay. Um, Here's just a last remark I'll make on this. For many millennials, and see, for those of us in this room old enough, uh, we'll, we'll sense the difference here. But for many millennials and, and younger now, becoming Catholic seems a little weird or strange or exotic in a way it didn't to my generation. Like when I was a kid, when almost everybody's religious, almost everybody accepted some version of the biblical take. Right? We sort of took it for granted. But for a lot of the young kids today, we have to remember that it seems a little strange, weird, exotic. And so we got to find creative ways to make the case. Okay. As I drop my pen. Okay, so that's the first two questions. Who are the unaffiliated? And we saw all the stats. Why are they leaving? And I think what I've laid out for you, it's not exhaustive, obviously, but based on a lot of reading of the data, based on my own many years of doing this research, I think are pretty representative reasons why the young people are leaving. Which brings me now, finally, to the third question. How do we get them back, or to nuance it a bit, how do we prevent potential unaffiliated from actualizing the potential? How do we keep... Uh, young people in the church. Uh, because it's a mystical number, I decided on nine <laughs> recommendations. Uh, not in any really particular order, but uh, nine things I'm going to recommend that I think would be helpful. Don't worry, I won't go on and on about this. Um, so this one's for the, for the practitioners. And that's really everybody in this room. First question was for the empiricists, second for the theoreticians, now for the pra practitioners. And, and we're all that. We're all involved in the practice of trying to, you know, keep people connected to Christ and his church, right? So, recommendation number one. Get young people involved in the works of justice. So I'm happy now, this is the great theme of our, of our Congress this year. And I'm going to affirm it as a very, very important and very powerful reason or means for keeping young people connected. The surveys 
consistently reveal that young people and the unaffiliated in, in particular instinctively get the importance of social justice. And I, I think you, you see why. You know, I mean, who, who's against social justice? And I don't mean that in a trivializing way. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a door that people very readily go through. They naturally like this aspect of the church's life. Okay, maybe we should lead with it. Maybe we should take it very seriously as we try to get the young people reaffiliated. The more concretely they're involved in the works and life of justice, the closer they remain to the church. That's been proven over and over again. And so I would say, talk about Dorothy Day, Thomas Merton, Jacques Maritain, Reynold Hillenbrand, Mother Teresa of Calcutta, Rose Hawthorne, not to mention Francis of Assisi, Vincent de Paul, Peter Claver, Martin de Porres, Bartolome de las Casas, etc., etc. It's part of our glory. It's our pride and joy, isn't it, Catholic educators, that we have this connection up and down the centuries. It comes roaring up out of the prophets, in the mouth of Jesus himself, and into the great tradition, this commitment to justice, the works of justice. And our young people like that. They're connected to it. It's a door they go through very readily. And even more important than talking about it, get them involved. And you know how to do this. I, I know from my own region, you know, so many of our educators are, are really good at this. Getting young people involved in soup lines, Catholic worker houses, prison ministry, outreach to the homebound, community organizing, care for immigrants, etc. The more they're into this, the more they do it, the more connected they feel to the life of the church. I've quoted this line before, I know, maybe even here, but um, Origen, one of the great church fathers, was approached one day by this young man called Gregory. And Gregory said he wanted to learn the doctrine that Origen had, the doctrine of the Christians. And Origen said to him, first live our life, and then you'll understand our doctrine. It's good instinct, you know. First, join the rhythm of the Christian life. See what Christians do. And then you'll understand their life from the inside. Or this, from Jared Manley Hopkins, the great Jesuit poet from the 19th century, convert uh, through the influence of John Henry Newman. A guy that, as you know, anyone that's read his poetry knows about his religious uh, struggles as well as his deep religious perceptions. But he himself was approached by a young person who said he was wrestling with his faith. What should I do? He asked Jared Manley Hopkins. And Hopkins didn't give an argument or an apologetic uh, exercise. He said, give alms. That's a really good instinct. In other words, he connected him right away to the works of justice and love and the corporal and spiritual works of mercy. Good, good. That keeps our young people connected and, I would say, draws them back. A couple of quotes I like from Stephen Bullivan's survey. Here's from a woman, 64, again, who has left the church, but says, I admire the fact that the Catholic Church is the biggest provider of health and education after governments in the world. And that's simply the case, isn't it? Another quote, it, the church, has soft power. Its reach is virtually ubiquitous. And I believe this could be important in various ways. For example, monitoring modern slavery. It also, the church, contributes greatly to education and health worldwide. It's good for charity. That's from a woman, 79, who is disaffiliated, but still retains the strong sense of the church's justice commitment. Just one more from a woman, 54. I love the idea that throughout the world, the Catholic Church is strongly involved in helping the poor and the needy. Good. That's a way, everybody, to keep our people connected. Lead with, emphasize, talk about, trumpet, announce, participate in the works of justice. Okay? Second recommendation. And this was my talk uh, last year. So if you heard me last year, maybe I'm repeating a few things. But 
use the via pulchritudinis. I'm using Pope Francis' phrase there. The via pulchritudinis is the way of beauty, right? The way of beauty. I've said this often before, but I'll say it, I think, until the church uh, gets it. Because, you know, today in our postmodern world, leading with the true or the good tends to be a non-starter, right? Especially with the young. If you say, here's the truth, or even worse, here's what you need to do. But they, you know, that's when all the hackles go up. That's when all the defensiveness and all the self-invention and don't tell me what to think, right? However, the third great transcendental, you have the good, the true, and the beautiful, that the beautiful is far more inviting. It's less threatening. It's more winsome. Use it. Simply show people the beauty of the Catholic tradition. And that, too, is part of our glory, isn't it? Show them the Sistine Chapel or the San Chapelle or a Fra Angelico painting or the North Rose window at Notre Dame or read them from the Divine Comedy of Dante. It's our glory, everybody. We did not walk the iconoclastic path. And that's always a temptation within the religious tradition, isn't it? It's a puritanical uh, temptation. No, 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 leave the, leave the images you know, to the side. and It's just a matter of, of mind and thought and word. Hmm. No, no, the great Catholic tradition didn't walk that path. But embrace the visual arts, the creative arts, the literary arts, architecture and painting and poetry and drama. Good. That's our glory. Use it to keep our young people connected. Do we, I mean educators, DREs and teachers and catechists, do we know our great aesthetic tradition? I mean, could you give your, your um, 14 or 15-year-olds a really cool, compelling slide presentation on Notre Dame Cathedral. Spend a couple classes talking about Dante's Divine Comedy. Walk them through some of Fra Angelico's paintings. I think knowing that tradition, reverencing it, is super important. You know, I'll pay tribute here to my friend, uh, the late Monsignor Bill Quinn. Bill was part of a great generation of Chicago priests who were influenced by someone I just cited, namely Monsignor Reynold Hillenbrand. And Hillenbrand was the great advocate of social justice flowing from the liturgy. Social justice flowing from the liturgy. Well, I was talking one time, I was a very young priest when I knew Bill Quinn. He was, he was in his 70s at the time. But I talked about Bill's great commitment to justice. He was a man of justice. Indeed, he was. Working with Cesar Chavez out here many years ago working with, with Dr. King, many others in the 60s and 70s. But he took me aside. I was a young guy. And he said, you know, that's true what you're saying. Is that I was really committed to justice. But he said to me, you know where that came from? It came from my love of the beauty of the Catholic tradition. And then he spoke to me very movingly about Dante and about Thomas Aquinas. And he was the first one. I'm just a young kid. He was the first one to tell me in detail about Chart Cathedral. Huh. Social justice all the way. Bill Quinn, great prophet of social justice. But the deepest ground for it, he told me, was in the aesthetics of the church, the via pulchritudinis. I think it still draws people in. Do we appreciate good TV? good films and music. Can we talk about them with our young people especially? Here's a couple quotes from Stephen Bullivant. Here's from a man, 64, disaffiliated, but still says this. The Catholic Church has been a major cultural force in European history. It has at times supplied a necessary spiritual discipline. I can respect it for that. Another, I find attractive the history of the church our roots in the Middle East, our diversity in the world, fine arts and music. That's from a young man, 21. And then another young man. It's fine artistic and liturgical tradition. That attracts them. 
I love this from a young woman, 19. I love Catholic theology, liturgy, devotion, art, and music. That's a disaffiliated young person, right? She's walked away, but still remains haunted by the beauty in our tradition. Okay. Number three, and I, you know, I, I wouldn't be upset really if on my gravestone some version of this is carved. Stop dumbing down our faith. And I know I've said it often and in this arena before, but did we listen, as the Pope said, listen to the young people. As we listened, we heard them say, reason one, the predominant reason was, we didn't get answers to these questions. We find the faith illogical. We think science refutes it. I think what you see, everybody, and I'll just be blunt about it, I think what you see in those statistics are the bitter fruits of a bad pastoral judgment made about 60 years ago. A judgment to dumb down the faith in the way we present it. I was the first generation to receive it. I went to first grade in 1965, the year the council ended. Um, it's now maybe two generations after me have received, I think, a similarly dumbed-down education. Look, are we good at the justice stuff? I think we are. I think we, we draw people in, and, and they get that. More to it, are we pretty good at the spiritual side of it? You know, retreats and all that. Yeah, and the kids get that. But they're complaining they're not getting intellectually satisfied. They're not getting answers. And it, part of it is the bitter fruit of our decision to dumb down the presentation of the faith. I think, and I say it to this room, pointing the blaming finger at me and at all of us, I think we all need seriously to pick up our game on this one on the intellectual presentation of our faith and the use of our great theological tradition. Here's something else, and I wonder if the teachers here agree with me on this. It's been my experience based on a lot of years now. I think we grossly underestimate what our young people are capable of in religious instruction. That's my experience. You know, and I've been on this before, but... I got this nephew of mine now, Drew, who is a great kid. He's a sophomore at MIT, so he's super brilliant. He shows me stuff he's working on in mathematics. I have zero idea what he's talking about. Brilliant kid. I remember asking him one time, did your, and I named his high school, this is a public high school he went to outside Chicago. I said, did your, your high school prepare you well for MIT? And he said, oh yeah, oh yeah. In other words, this, this smart kid, Walked into MIT, first day of class, felt totally prepared by his high school for that level of instruction. Now, what that told me was, at the high school level in science and math, he was getting this, upper level, right? Let's be honest, everybody in this room. Are we giving our kids in religion instruction at that level in high school? Or are we tending to give them pretty low-level stuff? And the question is, why? Why are we doing that? Because the statistics are telling us that's what they're complaining about. That's what they didn't get, is proper food for their minds. You know, so I think it was a, it was a pastoral decision we made, somehow to make it, I don't know what, more relevant or easier to take in or something. Man, we don't make math and science simple and easy to take in. We, we make these kids jump. So they're ready for MIT when the time comes. Why aren't we giving them the same kind of instruction in religion? So I've said it before. I mean, why not Aquinas and why not Augustine and Bonaventure and, and C.S. Lewis and Chesterton and in our religion classes? I mean, why do we tend to give our kids such a watered-down uh, version of it? Okay, end of rant on that subject. Um, thank you. I, I will accept applause for that rant because I, I believe it, everybody. The next, you know... Um, <laughs> joking on ice. Um, I say it to publishers, you know, and editors and catechists and, and those who write the books and everything. You know, we're all here. Um, 
You know, so I, I've been on this, but I'll, I'll just say something quick about with a special emphasis on faith and science. So stop dumbing it down, and let's put a special emphasis on faith science because it's bugging the heck out of our kids. So uh, I did this program up in my pastoral region, up in Santa Barbara area, of bringing in these posters of the great Catholic scientists. And I told the pastors, look, I have no real authority, but I'll, I'll invoke it anyway. Uh, I, want, I want all these up in all the schools. And they did, and, and in the parishes. I want posters of the great Catholic scientists. I want our kids to know from very early on that the faith science thing is, is not right, you know. So there's a wonderful picture. I, you have it up there of, um, of Georges Lemaitre, the formulator of the Big Bang Theory. One of the most important scientists of the 20th century was a Catholic priest. How many of our Catholic kids know that? As they buy all this nonsense about, you know, the, the, that we're, we're opposed to science. How many of our own kids know that, I wonder? Something I've told uh, pastors, I believe this strongly, facilitate conversations between young people and scientists in your parish communities. One time, this is one weekend I was up in my region, and I went to a couple of parishes, and I said, could all the scientists here stand up? And I, I said, you know, look, physicians and, and nurses and chemists and astronomers and teachers of science, could all the science people stand up? And, and there were a lot of them. There were a lot of them. I said, we got to get you talking to the young people. And because I can say it till the cows come home about religion and science you know, don't, uh, um, are, not, are not in contradiction. But you get somebody whose whole life is about science, and yet they come to church on Sunday. Get them talking to the young kids early on. Okay, just one more under this uh, heading uh, I feel strongly about. Lots and lots of studies, everybody, have shown the importance of religious books. Again, I'm not proposing this as some, you know, uh, be-all and end-all answer, but lots of studies have shown the importance of key religious books at decisive moments in people's lives. You're looking at one, by the way. I've told the story before about Thomas Aquinas when I was a kid in high school, but, but that illumination set me on this path I'm still on. I can't tell you how many stories of converts and reverts I've heard that involve something like, you know, I read C.S. Lewis's Mere Christianity. I read Chesterton's Orthodoxy. I read, and I'll fill in the blank, but I read a book that, that answered a question, shed light on a problem, cleared up a, a, a difficulty. Get religious, good religious books in the hands of our young people, you know? Um, Parish programs that involve a book that we're all going to read together. I love that. Get small groups organized around it to discuss the book. Okay. Let me cut to the chase a little bit. There's a lot more I'd say about that, but uh, all right. Number four. Number four. Emphasize community. Emphasize community. We want to keep our young people from becoming unaffiliated. We want to draw the unaffiliated back. What comes very clear in the, in the Stephen Bullivant study is that so many of the unaffiliated retain a powerful and nostalgic sense of the community that they miss in their parish. Listen to some of these quotes. This is from someone, again, who's left. My local parish is and always will be home to me. Even when I return after a long break, I'm always welcome back and feel this parish is definitely for me. Someone else. In my old parish, it was a sense of community spirit. The families of all the children at the local school attended together and enhanced the experience, especially for First Communions and Baptisms. Another, the community is hugely central to the fond memories I have of growing up in a Catholic family, et cetera, et cetera. I love community. I've been lucky in living in a parish that feels like a family. All these quotes, and I think we know that, don't we, from our own intuitions. When the parish feels like a real community or family, it tends to keep people connected. 
when it feels that way, it draws people back. So I would just say to all that these are now, especially to, to pastors and, and uh, parish ministers out there, whatever makes your parish feel like a family is a really good thing and will tend to keep the younger people connected. I remember I paid tribute to Bill Quinn and other great Chicago priests when I was a deacon, you're a young guy, Father Larry Kelly, who was a great man. And um, I remember I'm a young guy, 25, and uh, I'm looking at him for advice, and he said, kiddo, Sunday is the best day of the week. i never forgotten that. And of course, it's, it's a commonplace, but it's an important truth, isn't it? Especially for priests. Kiddo, Sunday is the best day of the week. Make sure that Sunday is a day that your people really feel connected to the church. That's your day to be on with the smile and the encouraging word and the, and the answer to a question and the, and the embrace of the, someone who's suffering. Sunday's the best day of the week. Whatever makes your parish, especially on Sunday, feel like a community is a great thing. Here's something from um, the Youth Synod. I, I still remember. One of the young people got up. You know, the unique thing about that synod was that there were cardinals and bishops and, and the pope and all the usual kind of suspects were there. But then in the upper right of the room, they had 30 um, young people. And, and they made themselves heard. I don't know if you heard about this, but, you know, so some cardinal would give a very staid, you know, presentation. And then to his infinite surprise, one of the kids would go like, whoo, <laughs> And... and uh, it was funny, I was, I was there for this moment when just before one of the gatherings, the Pope himself walked up, up, up to the, where the young people were, and he spoke to them. And we all wondered, like, what is he telling them? You know? Well, we found out. He told them, keep going, woo, woo, <laughs> because I like that, you know. Um, anyway, I, I, I thought of that because one of the young people said in her speech, and she was addressing the, the bishops there, we young people don't want bureaucrats and managers. We want spiritual fathers. Well, dead right, it seems to me, right? We, yeah, there we go. Woo! There we go. We don't want bureaucrats and managers. We want spiritual fathers. That means someone presiding over a community and a family, right? doing what fathers do vis-a-vis -a, -vis a family, which is encourage and instruct and protect and, in, and admonish and send and all of that. So for all the parish people, that's what the young people want, and that will keep them more connected. Okay, number five, and I'll do some of these quickly. I know we're running out of time. Number five, place a special stress on the mass. If you want to keep young people from becoming unaffiliated, you want to draw them back, put a special stress upon the mass. Here's a couple quotes. I enjoy the ritual of mass and the tradition. I like the fact it's the same wherever I go. Now, mind you, that's from a woman 51. She's not talking about the Latin mass. It's not that. She's talking about, I think, the, the, the sameness of the ritual and, and the beauty of that, the beauty of a ritual consciousness, right? That you enter into a a familiar and, and repetitive uh, uh, practice. How about this one from a woman, 38? The Mass will always be a comfort, and no matter where I am, it feels like coming home when I go to Mass. It breaks my heart not to be able to participate fully now. She's one of the people with the divorce and remarriage thing, too. Um, another one, the routine of Mass, while it can intimidate and isolate you at first, becomes very comforting later. The final one, I like the feeling of comfort I get with a ritual I had taken part in my whole life. And it's interesting about the word comfort, and I wouldn't, you know, poo-poo that or, or say that's something trivial. They're talking, I think, about a very deep level of the soul, right? If there's, a, there's a comfort at that level of soul that's coming precisely from this ingenious ritual that we have of the Mass. Vatican II, the source and summit of the Christian life is the Mass. That's what they're talking about, right? Whatever makes the Mass powerful for people, whatever draws them to the Mass, that's a good thing. That keeps them connected. I won't go to more. I mean, you've heard all the 
particular studies that talk about especially hospitality, music, homilies. And, and that's affirmed all the time in the, in the studies, too. What, what keeps people connected to Mass? That they're welcomed. And you know this. It's much more than just, you know, the welcoming committee. God bless them, the people that are the official welcomers. It means the whole family of the parish is in a welcoming attitude. I can't tell you how often I run into this. People that have left, and they'll say, when I left, nobody cared. You know, no one from the parish, either the people or the leadership, no one from the parish sought me out or asked why I left. That's not the way the family ought to behave, right? Hospitality, music, homilies. Let me say one thing about uh, homilies. And I, I've, I've spoken a lot about preaching, and it's sort of a passion of mine. I'll just say two simple things. One is, don't be afraid. I'll say this now to the preachers here. Don't be afraid of making your homilies theologically rich. See, remember all those stats about the young nuns, the young unaffiliated who've run away from the church, giving as number one reason, I don't believe in these doctrines. How do we keep them from leaving? <laughs> They're, maybe they're not getting in school at all. One of the only places they might get when they're sitting out there as young kids or teenagers with their parents, one of the only places they might get a real entertainment of interesting and deep questions is the homily. But I, but I think we're, we're so concerned about making it as you know, accessible as possible. But what they want very often is illumination for their minds. They do want to wrestle with the deep questions. Don't be afraid to intellectualize and theologize in your homilies. You know, just a couple days ago, I was way up at the northern part of my region, way up near Orchid and St. Santa Maria, at this wonderful high school. Hey, are you there? At uh, St. Joseph High School. And um, one of the professors there uses a book of mine in his sophomore religion class. So he asked me after Mass to come in. Well, it was a delight. I mean, first of all, I miss teaching. I'm a teacher, you know, and I don't do it as much. But I got in front of this class. These are all 15-year-olds, right? Man, they were good questions. And, and they weren't about the hot-button stuff. That's fine. I, mean, I, I like the hot-button questions. They're fine. But they were, they were much deeper. 15-year-olds asking me about God and proving God's existence, asking me about the meaning of life, asking me about suffering and evil, asking me about the cross and the resurrection and redemption. Good. Good. The kids have those questions, and they're not getting answered. And that's one of the reasons they're leaving. Don't be afraid to intellectualize and theologize in our preaching. Second quick thing I'll say about the preaching, don't be afraid of the Bible. See, again, my, my generation, we were trained this way. Uh, always run to your experience first. <laughs> now, I get it. Homilies are meant to connect to life. I get it. They should. But see, everybody, if... if they don't hear something in a homily they can't hear anywhere else, then what's the point? See, what, the Bible, the Bible, that's our book. Vatican II wanted to revive it, not run away from it. The Bible's our book. Our preaching should be biblically rich and biblically informed, and that gives young people something they won't get anywhere else in the culture. Don't be afraid of it. Okay, let me do a, I'll just do a couple more. I know i got to bring it to a close. Um, six, turn every parish into a missionary society. Turn every parish into a missionary society. Um, Vatican II couldn't have been clear on this, right? That's where the new evangelization starts. It starts with John the 23rd and Vatican II. Lumen Gentium. Christ is the lumen. Don't think the key to getting young people back is dialing down our moral ideals. I don't think caving into the, to the culture's uh, philosophy is the right move. I, I know the culture says that any kind of sex you want is great as long as you're not hurting anybody, right? That's a hopelessly reductive understanding of sex. I don't think we ought to subscribe to that. I think we ought to hold up our extreme demand. But, and here's Pope Francis, the great corrective, and that's how I read him in the, kind of in the long, with the long view. You know, John Paul was a great heroic call to virtue. Terrific. 
the, the church wants to make saints. You know, we're not interested in spiritual mediocrities. We want saints. Okay. But the shadow side of a John Paul thing is, well, what do you do when, when you can't or you won't or you fail or you don't live up to it, right? Well, now Francis comes with the church as a field hospital. How beautiful that is. Where wounded people are treated with love and they're healed and they're given the medicine they need, right? Good. That's the right combination. Don't, don't dial down John Paul II, but just make sure you add Francis to the picture. You know what I'm saying? Don't, don't, don't surrender the John Paul heroism. But add to it the, the, the Francis compassion for, for those who are, who are less than perfect. Anyway, that, there's much more to say about that, but that was number seven. Um, number eight, don't worry, number nine is super short. So number eight. Um, you want to keep uh, young people in the church? You want to draw them back? Everybody, we've got to be digital missionaries. We, we've got to be digital missionaries. Here's, here's something I said at the Youth Synod. I, I don't think I was really taking all that seriously. So I would say things that people would... Mm-hmm. But one point I made at the Youth Synod was there's an interesting confluence in our time between crisis and solution. So I said publicly and in the small groups, a lot of the things I've been saying to you about the crisis that we're facing, right, of the unaffiliated. But then I said, through a weird bit of God's providence, the solution has presented itself, which is the rise of the social media. Now, believe me, I know all the negatives of the social media. I mean, I I suffer from them a lot. So every, you know, crazy person and his brother can be on social media, and, and they can say whatever they want, and so I get it. It's full of, you know, crazy people and, and, and wicked people and all that. I get it. I get it. But I'm going to hang on to this. I think in God's providence, it's a, it's a marvelous tool we've been given. Because look at the unaffiliated I, we've been talking about all morning. They're not going to come to our programs. I kept saying that at the youth synod. They were going on and on about parish programs and how the parish. I said, yeah, I know that's good, but they're not going to come to our programs. We got to get them. We have to go into their world. And where are they living? They're living in the world of the social media, right? And so we have this tool now that enables us to get into that world in a nonviolent way. It's not, not a, like some intrusive, you know, aggressive way, but in an inviting way. And that's, I think, so important. Um, a quick word about my own work with Word on Fire, because this is what I've been doing for the past now almost 20 years. Um, What's the key to it, people have asked me? I'd say this, lots of fresh material. So I've known people in parishes that say, oh, we got a good social media outreach. You know, every month we put up something new. Well, (laughs) believe me, that's not going to work. Lots of fresh material. Secondly, a chance to comment. You've got to be interactive. And I know it's a pain. I know crazy people and obscene people and stupid and wicked people come forward. I know they do. But it's worth it, I think. It's worth it to engage people. Give them the opportunity to comment and so on. I I can tell you a million stories about how that process has brought people back. So I I believe in it. Third thing I've said about War on Fire is it's a semina verbi approach. The seeds of the word, right? My assumption is that the seeds of the word are everywhere in the culture. With all of its twistedness and all of its sin, I see it. But nevertheless, in films and in music and in in the popular and high culture, you can find seeds of the word. Point them out to people. Start with that. Don't start with finger wagging. Don't start with, you know, here's what you have to do. Begin with, hey, look. Hey, look. Do you see that in that movie? Do you see that in the book everyone's reading? Do you see this in in this pop culture figure? There's something of the gospel there. So fresh material, a chance to interact, use the semi verbi. That's been the formula. And I, I think it can be used at any level, any parish level. I don't know if you know about this um, Reddit uh, AMA thing. Uh, you know, the Reddit, this hugely popular uh, internet phenomenon where people get on and you know, converse and comment. And the AMA means ask me anything, right? 
Well, I, I'm, a, I'm, I'm a student of medieval theology. The minute I heard that, I said, that's a quadlibital question. <laughs> so, you're thinking he's lost his mind. No, in, in the Middle Ages, uh, Thomas Aquinas would come into a room and quadlibital, quadlibet in Latin means whatever you want. And that the people in the room could ask him anything they had in their mind. And Aquinas would respond. So when I heard about the AMA on Reddit, I thought, that's a quadlibital question. So I'm game. And I had a ball. We did this about six months ago, I think. And uh, we opened it up for um, like an hour and a half. And I was just on the computer. And I, I don't know, my word on fire team can tell me, but this, I was third behind Bill Gates and Jordan Peterson for the number. And I, I'm saying it not to show off, but <laughs> the point I'm making there is that I think, see, religion, religion, when I, when I announced myself as a Catholic bishop who loves to debate with atheists. That's how we announced it. And it was, it was like, I think 12,500 questions came through in, in an hour and a half. But you see, everybody, look, that is such good news. Oh, we got to dumb it down. Oh, don't talk about these things. Just talk about your experience. No, no, they're fascinated. They asked me about God and Jesus and eternal life and everything. Good, good, good. That's a hopeful sign. That's a hopeful sign. Okay, I'm, I'm ranting again. I'm sorry. Um, so, I mean, here, here's just a... <laughs> Woo! <-hoo. laughs> yeah. I'll tell the Pope that you enjoyed it. Um, see, I, I think everybody... This it, it seems like a commonplace, but I think every parish in America should have a very strong social media outreach. And I don't mean simply to share information, as important as that is, like the parish bulletin approach. But I mean this sort of thing, to evangelize, to engage the culture, to do an AMA. I mean, what if a, a pastor or associate or you, you have someone on the, on the staff that knows the culture, that has got the social media in her fingertips? Get on there. Okay, ask me anything. You know, trust me, you're going to get some traction. You're going to get some young people interested. Um, I've told bishops now... Uh, Send one of your smartest priests for doctoral studies, but not to teach in a university or a seminary. This is the cutting edge. Train your, your smartest kid. If I, you know, if I were ordinary of a diocese, I would do it. Train your smartest priest to, to be the charge of the social media outreach for your diocese. That'll pay huge dividends. Uh, you know, keep in mind for most uh, millennials and younger, the first contact they'll ever have with your parish is the website. I mean, you know that, right? Then how come our websites are so boring very often and so poorly designed? <laughs> no, but think about it. Where do we put our money and time and energy and effort? For, you want young people not to leave? You want to draw them back? To me, number one priority, website. Take a cue, by the way, from the Mormons. Um, you know, go back... Um, some years now, but the Mormons were cutting edge at using their website. It was sharp, it was funny, it was colorful, it was engaging. Now, compare it to the Vatican website. <laughs> you know, it's, it's like, it's the color of parchment. <laughs> Could it be any duller? Talk about beige Catholicism. And, and it's, it's text after text after, I mean, come on. So take a page from the Mormons knew how to do this to engage uh, young people. And then the final thing on this point, uh, don't give up. A lot of people come to me now, and it's, I always smile, and they'll say, oh, you know, Word on Fire, you're this big, you know, thing. Oh, man, Word on Fire started with nothing. I didn't know what a website was. And I was delighted when I first, someone told me, you know that video? That got 300 views. I'm not kidding. I was like, really? 300 people watched it? My point is... We started very small and gradually with lots of fresh material, lots of interaction, you know, lots of cultural engagement, build it up. You can do it too. Okay, I promise this is the end. Thank you. Um, I promise this is the end. The, the final thing, and I can say it very simply, and I, this is not a pious boilerplate. I put it at the end because the most important uh, figure in a liturgical procession comes at the end, right? So I put this at the end. Pray. I, I've been a priest for 33 years. Um, I've been presiding at liturgies for all this time. I, have I 
ever, I wonder, heard a prayer in a parish for the unaffiliated, for those who have drifted away, for those who have left our parish, uh, for young people who are lost and have wandered. I, I don't know if I ever have. Start, start praying. Get, get your homebound and, and the, get the, the elderly and, and the sick in your parish who might feel, what, what can I contribute? Pray. Get them to pray in a focused way. Get your adoration group. Say, you know, for the next month, I want you to pray for this theme. Maybe even, there's a particular person I want you to pray for. Someone that's wandered away and I, we want to get him or her back. Pray, pray. Okay. So with that, everybody, I hope uh, I give you at least a little food for thought. And, um, you know, I, except for the clergy sex abuse thing, which is the number one thing we have to wrestle with now, I think this is the number two uh, issue. So let's just get our minds and hearts around it. And God bless you for listening today. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Bishop, Bishop Barron, I need to remind you to go to your book signing. Your book signing. He will be there. I would like to thank Bishop Barron for his great words that will carry us through the rest of this Congress. I also need two reminders. Please remember to fill out those evaluations that are online so that way we can continue to make each and every Congress great. Also, we are in need of help from the ministers of Holy Communion to assist in the distribution of communion at these arena liturgies. Please sign up at the Ministers of Holy Communion. The table is located in front of the sacristy, just outside the west entrance of the arena. Have a great day. at the hospital police investigating that shooting the stability of the entire region drone strikes on behind the terror attack last week